So you want to know about the chip? So do I. Why is everyone getting so excited about this little device? It's just a chip after all, isn't it? Or is it? So the chip is here. The chip. That brings back memories. So, I'm finally getting around to opening up this package that's been sitting on my desk for almost a month. Let's get into it. For this video, I'm not going to compare it to any other fruity options, but instead let you draw your own conclusions. For those lucky enough to back this Kickstarter, then you should really have your chip already. The package arrived in fairly sturdy packaging. No complaints there. I backed the chip with the pocket chip option. The chip came as is, and I didn't back the HDMI or VGA add-ons. I sort of regret that now, and so just had the composite cable to work with. And this is a little baby, fairly compact. Before we check out the chip, let's first check out what the pocket chip gives us. The pocket chip is a nice little case that you can plug a chip into and adds a few portable features. My initial thoughts were, for a maker slash hacker product, it was professionally packaged, something you'd find on a consumer electronics shop. So there we have the pocket chip. I wouldn't really call it pocket, but more phablet, minus the phone bit, so maybe just ablet. Uh, but then it has a keypad, so maybe padablet, or whatever. On the back of the pocket chip, you can see the LiPo battery, which they claim gives you 5 hours of uptime, the chip itself, and solderable points, providing access to all the extra GPIOs that the pocket chip hasn't used. On the front, we see the full QWERTY keypad and LCD touchscreen. There's also some quirky things like a nice little hole for a 2HB pencil, which is supposedly to hold your pencil when you're not using it a lanyard holder thingy, which sounds fun, and another hole for something that someone hasn't really thought of yet. The chip itself plugs neatly into a socket on the back and can be removed easily enough. The labelling on the pocket chip is nuts and really shows that it's aimed for makers and not consumers. Powering up is easy enough and they make every effort to onboard people as quickly as possible. Just plug in your micro USB cable and press the power button at the bottom of the keypad. It'll take a while to boot as it's not the world's fastest MCU and eventually present you with a quick help guide. Nice. You have access to some basics that I reckon are essential for such a device, such as the terminal app, which I have to admit is a little annoying on the tiny keypad as it tends to slow you down somewhat, but it's fully functional. Then we have the game section, which is a game section. Uh, I'll leave that for someone else to review. Also a music app. Help, text editor, and file browser. All the essentials. You also have power control and the ability to reflash the pocket chip firmware and control over LCD brightness and Wi-Fi. Connecting to Wi-Fi is trivial and worked as expected. So that's about it for the pocket chip. Now let's get on to the good stuff. The chip has some basic peripheral ports, starting from the top right working clockwise. We have a standard single USB 2.0 port, a TRRS connector providing stereo audio and composite video, micro USB power port, which can also be configured as OTG, LiPo battery connector, power button, two expansion headers, more on that later, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module, AXP209 power management, and 4 gig NAND flash. On the other side, there is 512 megs of DRAM and the all-winner MCU. The two headers provide a swag of GPIO options. You have power and ground, analog temperature sensor input, LiPo battery and power on, I2C, resistive touch, LCD or further additional GPIOs, pulse width modulation, UART, audio out, microphone, FEL mode pin, ADC, GPIO expander, application processor interrupt, CSI or further additional GPIOs. All the GPIOs can be used in low level mode or the chip also provides a framework for creating your own devices that attach to the chip called DIPS. 
Dips are quite extensive, and if you're serious about creating a chip add-on, you need to read this documentation. Power up the chip using the micro USB port. If you're running without a display, then I'd suggest plugging it in to your computer first, because then you can log into it directly. On Mac, Windows and Linux, it'll appear as another COM port. On a Mac or Linux, you can connect using Screen or any other serial terminal program. Then log in using root and chip for the password. You can also connect up to the onboard serial port if you want. Either using a USB to UART adapter or even a Pi works just as well. Once logged in, you'll see the familiar Debian Linux OS. The Kickstarter backers will have seen 4.3 of the Linux kernel, but a 4.4 kernel build has just been released for the chip. The first thing to do is to connect it to a Wi-Fi access point. Use NMCLI for this, which is fairly straightforward. The second order of business is to update and also upgrade Debian. Once complete, reboot. Now don't be tempted to install the 4.4.11 kernel using Debian as you'll find things just might not work afterwards. If you want to upgrade, then use the official way, which is to connect the fell pin to ground when powered down. Power up the chip, download the latest version from flash.getchip.com using Google Chrome, and the first time you visit this page, you'll have to install an add-on into Chrome. Then you can click on Choose a File, which will guide you through the process I just mentioned. Find the file that you just downloaded, then click on Start Flashing, which should finish in a short amount of time. Exit the flasher, disconnect the power, remove the jumper lead, and power back up again, and you should be running the latest kernel. So moving on to testing out the GPIO. My usual LED breadboard will do the trick, which works as expected, except the LEDs didn't glow as bright, which sort of suggests a much lower GPIO output current. Apart from that, nothing else to see here. Move along. You can also use a Python library that can be used in the same way as the Pi GPIO library, except the names of GPIO pins are a little different. Next, I tested out the I2C bus by wiring up a LUX sensor, but for some reason it never appeared on either two I2C buses. So then I wired up a high resolution temperature sensor, which appeared straight away, and I was able to use Adafruit's Python library to access it. Next, to test out the SPI bus with my handy dandy Mac 7219 LED matrix, but for some reason there were issues with it, even in the latest kernel. You can find a boot image that will enable SPI on this page. I've included this in the description below and on my website. I ran out of time to include SPI tests in this video, but we'll include it in a review update. Now, while I'm on the topic of support, there is already a massive community backing for the chip, and my money is on the chip exploding in popularity as much as the Pi. If only they can get the chip into the education market, then it'll be a Pi contender. So what about the company's claims? The world's first $9 computer? Well, it probably is, but it depends on your definition of computer. What about chip does serious work? I didn't test this out, but frankly, 512 megs isn't really something you could do serious work with. It certainly can connect to the internet, and people are already running MAME ROMs on the chip. So what score would I give this? I reckon it deserves a score of 4.9 out of 5. It certainly has everything I need for a small project, and a large community backing for support. Thanks for watching me unbox and review the chip. I hope you got something out of it. If you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to like. And if you're not a subscriber, you can really support me by subscribing. You'll also be notified when I publish a weekly video. Oh, before I go, if you're an Aussie and you're going to the Sydney Mini Maker Fair, you might see me roaming around covering the event over those two days. So feel free to come up and have a chat. Also, stay tuned on my channel for the chance to win prizes in two competitions that I'm running as part of the Maker Show. So see you next week.